Hello subscribers, hello others, it's David Hoffman, filmmaker. About to show you a clip from a film I made back in 1988 about smoking cigarettes that ran in primetime public television. How did I get that on primetime public television is part of the story I want to tell before you see the clip, which involves Philip Morris, the largest tobacco company, strategizing how they're going to sell cigarettes given the laws that exist at that time. So this is a challenge because in 1965, uh, we passed a law in the United States banning cigarette advertising. We did this because the Surgeon General shortly before said that cigarette smoking kills 300,000 people a year in America. I mean, it was proven fact. So they said no more cigarette advertising. Cigarette companies don't give up, of course. And in 1971, we put that label on the box that said, you know, it was bad for you. So what are the cigarette companies going to do? Well, I make this documentary called Showdown on Tobacco Road about the debate, and I'm making it in 1988. And PBS says, David, in order to get this on primetime television, you gotta have balance, balance. We're all hearing fair and balanced, and what does balance mean? Well, I know when I was a kid, Walter Cronkite said, and that's the way it was uh, September 4th, 1966. Except we know that wasn't the way it was. That's the way CBS showed to say it. They call it, that's the way it was. And CBS 60 Minutes, I remember the military putting cameras behind the interview so that they could record the interview because 60 Minutes, which was fair and balanced, was actually editing from a 90 minute interview to a three minute clip that wasn't fair and balanced. It presented a point of view. And those of you who watch my documentaries know, I believe everything presents a point of view. So I said to PBS, how do I make cigarette smoking fair and balanced? And I come up with this idea. I go to the largest cigarette company in America, Philip Morris, right to the top guy, the head of public relations, Guy Smith. He's brilliant. And I say, hey, could I film you guys strategizing about how you're going to sell cigarettes to a population in an era when it's illegal to advertise? And he says, yeah, I'll let you do it. You can film us so long as you present it fair and balanced. I say, sure, I'll present your point of view. You're about to see that clip and I'm going to ask you something about it. Do these guys believe what they're saying? Do they believe cigarette smoking is about freedom and independence and the right of the individual to be themselves? Kind of the first amendment. Or are they pulling the wool over our eyes? Do they not themselves believe it? And are they just manipulating? And if they are, What's the morality that's in them? I mean, I'm a documentary filmmaker and I don't make documentaries that I know are lying. I could pick truth by picking this fact and ignoring that fact, but I couldn't do what they did here. By the way, before I run this, Guy Smith, after this era was over that you're about to see, he became the PR guy for President Clinton during his impeachment trial. So take a look and see what you think. PBS, primetime, 1988, the other side, fair and balanced. Your right to swing your fist ends when your fist hits my nose. Well, your right to smoke stops when your smoke hits my nose and my lungs and my heart. And it's as simple as that. Everyone has the right to smoke anywhere they want, and I'm for that. They just don't have the right to exhale everywhere they want. Tony Schwartz is an acknowledged advertising genius. Over the last 30 years, he's created thousands of commercials for corporations and political candidates. And today, because of the way he's employing his talent against smoking, he's one of the most powerful people in the anti-smoking movement. His little office in New York is media central for those opposed to cigarettes. He's made dozens of provocative anti-smoking commercials that are shaking up elected officials and the cigarette industry. When you are dealing with these social engineers, people fervently zealous about how they feel that their view of the way the world ought to be is the way it ought to be, they create controversy. They create headlines because they say, um, they say outrageous things. Well, that's a great way to get into the media. For good or for bad, mostly bad, I think. Guy the Smith Northeast, is the brilliant public East relations Coast, director of California, Philip Morris, the largest and most successful cigarette company in the world. 
He represents a new industry determination to speak out and defend itself and the rights of smokers, a determination backed by awesome financial power. Philip Morris, an international corporation with a worldwide flow of products. Serving more than 100 million people every day. Today, $35 billion worth of cigarettes are sold in the United States every year. Each of the six major cigarette manufacturers is also a large conglomerate with major interests in food, beverages, hotels, and TV stations. Companies like Philip Morris are fighting to stave off the anti-smokers in every way they can, by confronting them directly, by rallying smokers, and by doing their best to influence the American public. So they're going to ban advertising on the Bay Area Rapid Transit. What the hell are we going to do about it? I'm sure there's a commission that deals with that. So we need to find out who the players are and what our actual recourse is. I mean, I don't know how much money tobacco and alcohol actually pay to help support the transportation system. It's going to cost the people of San Francisco and the whole area $250,000 a year, which they're going to have to make up out of tax. $250,000. That's the contribution of, of beer and tobacco yeah. advertising. Well, alcohol and tobacco yeah. advertising. The disgusting thing about this is that, that these clowns make these kind of arbitrary rules, then they come up short on money, they want to raise the fares, and who gets hit? Oh, it's gonna be, yeah, the, the writers, little, the, the writers, little guy, the little guy. The, little guy. The, 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 the black that's just gotten off of welfare, that's trying to get to work, and is the on a fixed income. The limousine to work never sees yeah, those ads no, anymore. No, and he can smoke <clears> in his limousine, he can look at whatever ads he wants to. And they're probably going back to the federal government for more money while they're giving up another source of revenue. And the financial argument, I think, is gonna be a big one. The press doesn't give a damn about the economic argument for this rapid transit advertising censorship thing. John's government affairs people are going to find out the fine points, who appoints these people that are on this board that made this decision. Let's get the Tobacco Institute aware and uh, let's develop the censorship arguments oriented to, uh, uh, to this specific organization. The, the censorship argument is not just a smoker's argument. Right, no, that's by any means. It's, it's everybody's argument, or everybody who believes in the First Amendment. The tobacco industry is very, very skillful in dealing with the symbols of public debate. At first, the, the, the tobacco industry denied the evidence about smoking and health. Now they don't spend a lot of time doing, doing that. What they really have become is the champions of freedom, freedom of choice, freedom of speech. Now, up until the, you know, the mid-'70s, the Supreme Court considered commercials to be such a low form of speech that it wasn't entitled to any consideration under the First Amendment. And in fact, there is no question in the minds of most uh, First Amendment scholars that the Supreme Court, faced with a decision by Congress to ban advertising of cigarettes, knowing what we know about cigarettes, would uphold it unanimously. But the industry has succeeded, with the help of the American Civil Liberties Union, in mixing the question of a simple ban on the promotion of a product with the great principles of political speech and debate that come from the Constitution and the Jefferson and Madison debating about, about the fundamental principles of government. I think it's a lot of nonsense, frankly. The cigarette companies spend two and a half billion dollars a year to sell their products almost half of it to sponsor sports events, museums, musical performances, and to help many other causes. Many groups have come to depend on these contributions. This is especially true of some black organizations who are in conflict about accepting the money. Black groups were ignored by many American corporations when they desperately needed money for community activities and for, and for those kinds of organizations that contribute to, to community pride. And Philip Morris was there. It was there with the money. Now, I understand why uh, those, those leaders are not prepared to say to Philip Morris, you're drug pushers, you're trying to hook us and the whole community. But of course, that's why Philip Morris is there. Why on earth are they a great philanthropic co company? They've said themselves, they don't do this for, uh, for, uh, for charity. They, they're, they're a company that's in business to make money. 